Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Skip Lackey, a business leadership life and success coach who has worked with over 10,000 clients, taught over 1,000 workshops, and done over 1,000 personal appearances over his 35-year career. And over those 35 years, Skip has started multiple businesses in a variety of industries, from restaurant and hospitality, oil and gas, to vision technology. He has also performed on Broadway, in movies, television, and recorded countless voiceovers. Skip's personal mission is to enhance the lives of others by introducing consciousness, tools at work, and at home to anyone and everyone interested. Join us today as we chat with Skip about serial entrepreneurship, pivoting careers, and what it takes to make great leaders. And there he is. Good morning, Skip. How are you, buddy? Hi, Kirk. How are you this morning? <laughs> I'm good. Can you tell I'm a little out of breath after that intro? Oh, well, I, yeah, there's my, a lot there. There is a lot there. I cannot <laughs> wait to dive in. But buddy, I am, gosh, this is just going to be off the cuff. I am so comfortable People will know immediately that we've met. Our yeah. boys play baseball. Um, I, I've so enjoyed getting to know you over the last couple of years. I honestly, my wife thinks I enjoy hanging with you at the game more than the game itself, <laughs> which um, guilty, guilty, guilty. But uh, you know what? Before we dive in, there's a lot. There's a lot, but there's a couple of things that people may be reminded of when I start talking about. Um, some fun, right? Let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's talk first about your professional clown training, your career, right. and, and then segue into um, Think Fast, um, yeah. a, a game show that you hosted. But, but first and foremost, this, you've told me the story before of training to become a professional clown. Absolutely fascinating to me. So if you don't mind, please indulge. Sure. Um, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. And when I was a teenager, I started doing some theater. And I decided when I was in high school that I wanted to be a professional actor. So I went to an all boys Catholic uh, prep school, uh, really academically minded. Um, you know, guys were going to Harvard and Yale and Princeton. And it came time for me to go to school. And I was the oldest in my family and applied late to all the colleges. And as I was trying to, struggling, trying to figure out what I want to do, where I wanted to go next, a buddy of mine um, said, hey, I've got this application to Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Clown College. I think you should apply. So I was doing some clowning in Little Rock with him, and we were, uh, so it wasn't something that was way out of left field, but um, I ended up applying uh, they, they have 6,000 at the time, it's not running right now, but they had 6,000 applicants, 60 people got accepted, uh, school was free and you basically went and it was a big audition for 13 weeks. And if you got, if you were decent and they liked you, they offered you a job at the end of it. So here I was 17 years old, left home, went down there. Um, and worked my tail off. We were going six days a week, 12 hours a day. And it was, like I said, it was just a big audition to see if you could, uh, if you were funny, uh, what skills you had, all of that. And so I ended up getting a job offer and toured with Ringling Brothers uh, in, what was it, 79, 80, uh, 79 and 80. Unbelievable. And so, so, so through those auditions, um... You mean, obviously, humor is really important. You want to bring laughter to people. I mean, how do they do that? They put you on stage and give you a script or, you know, how can well, they tell? Uh, if you're funny, right. So there's no <laughs> stage at the circus, right? It's a ring. It's, it's a three ring yeah. circus. So yeah, yeah. Um, at the time, I the, the circus was traveling through Little Rock and I went backstage between shows and the boss clown there actually is a boss clown i love it that love runs it. the clown clown alley it's called okay and he pulled me aside and said hey okay come on out and they basically just took me out into the ring between shows and some of the kids of some of the performers sat on the ring and then 
at the time I was doing pantomime and I walked stilts and I juggled. So they were like, just do something. Unbelievable. So I, yeah. I, so I did an audition and the boss clown said, well, I'll recommend you. Uh, but this isn't one of the official uh, auditions. So this is what you need to do. You need to fill out. The application was like six pages long. And they asked you all of these personal questions because you're living Literally, I was living in a, a, a like a six and a half by six and a half train room with a roommate where it's, just, you know, you could touch the walls. <laughs> and so you've got to be able to get along with people. Or, yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's a survival. It, back then, it was survival of the fittest on the road. And what's the um, I'm just fascinated by. It. So so tons of people that come to right. these shows. Is everyone happy? and everyone polite or do you get some folks that want to poke fun at the clown oh oh you're talking about the audience the audience yeah oh, yeah you've got there's so, so many people that have these ideas about clowns in their head yeah and yeah. some are trying to show you up some are trying to show you they're funnier than you uh a lot of people are scared to death of clowns there are, yeah, there are yeah, more sure. people than you you know you'd imagine that are are just frightened of especially little kids sure 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 um, so it's, you know, you're hiding behind a mask and you can do pretty much whatever you want, at, at least back then. You can't do that now necessarily, but yeah. back then it was kind of the wild west. But um, you have to keep your composure no matter what happens. That's what they're oh, yeah. looking for too. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. And we had some things happen. We had uh, one time during a show, one of the uh, trapeze artists bounced out of the net. He was a 16 year old flyer and cracked and hit the ring curb. And, oh, you know, gosh. they yeah. they call for all the clowns to come out while they pull the, the performer out or the animals would, would be a little unruly at the time. Yeah. yeah. So we served a really valuable purpose of the glue that held the show together because we performed in between the acts. And, yeah. and, and Ringling Brothers in particular, that, that organization had been, I know the pandemic kind of slowed a lot of things down and maybe just life slowed things down, but they'd been around for what hundred years, something like that. Oh, geez. At the point that I did it, I think it was 125 years. And that was, isn't that something? Yeah. That was 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That I did that. So 42 years ago. Do you think it'll come back? You know what? They just announced the show is coming back with no animals and okay. no clowns though. They they've announced that no clowns. So they're doing more of a, Cirque du Soleil type. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, 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 so much. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep putting you on the spot here. I mean, you've worked with ABC, NBC, TBS, ESPN, um, the Golf Channel, uh, Nike, right. big companies like Nickelodeon, Walt Disney. We'll go to Nickelodeon because I think that's where the Think Fast uh, game show was, right? Right. So, tell yeah. me, like on the calendar, are we before? Um, the circus or after the circus when you hosted way after way, way after. The after circus was right out of high school okay. and then i moved to new york and was doing uh commercials and voiceovers and and a lot of theater in new york and on the road i did a lot of road companies of broadway musicals um so i was a singer and a dancer uh, how does somebody how does someone get into voiceovers do, do, do they i mean You've got to be on point. I imagine, I mean, these are big companies throwing a lot of money at someone who represents their brand. Do you audition right. for that as well? You do. Um, I had already done probably close to a hundred on camera <laughs> national network commercials on, yeah, yeah. on camera. And uh, so my agent started trying me at voiceovers, which is a real, I mean, that is a great thing to be able to do because you don't have to, I mean, it, it's great money professionally if you can start to break into it. So you go and you lay down copy and then they listen to 15 guys and then they pick you. Um, mm -hmm. And then eventually you have a, a reel that your agent will just submit and they'll listen to things that are similar. They like your voice and then they call you in and book you for the, for the job. So. Make, it know. makes total sense. So, so how did the think fast thing come about? So. This tell me a little bit about the game show. I've watched a few YouTube videos. Uh, I, I mean, how does that was the day, the age of game shows, right? Really, really popular. Cannot be easy to become the host of a game show. 
<laughs> you know, it was a bizarre thing because I just I got asked to go and audition uh, at Nickelodeon, and I'd never. I mean, it's I'd never done a game show. I didn't know what that was, but <laughs> but uh, they were looking for somebody that had a lot of energy. They had a previous host on the show uh, during its first season, and they felt that his energy was a little lower. So they were looking for somebody that was, you know, spunky at the time. That was me. You know, I was, how old was I? I was about 20, maybe 29. Uh -huh. And, and so um, I auditioned, did a bunch of auditions for the, the producers and the director. They liked it. Then they put me on another game show as a, as a guest host uh, on something called Total Panic, which was one of the other shows that was being filmed in New York City. I was living in New York and LA at the time. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, they liked what they saw. So they hired me. And this was when they were building Universal Studios, Florida, and they were building Nickelodeon Studios and they had a back lot and they were doing the studio tour. And so we went down there and filmed a ton of episodes and then did a bunch of other jobs for them, touring, doing live game shows for kids because the show was a hit. And, um, you know, it was on five days a week. So if you were of a certain age, you'd come home from school, turn on the TV, turn on Nickelodeon, which all the kids were watching. Sure, sure. And so it was weird having a little bit of stardom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with kids. So I'd go someplace and kids would recognize me, <laughs> you know? And so I would be asked for my autograph and friends were there and they would go, what, why are they asking you? What? And I was like, yeah, 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 I have this show on Nickelodeon. And they were like, what? And you it was kind of fame. I, I just well, love it. I've always been curious though. You said it was on five days a week. So, so these are live one take things, right? You guys aren't recording and editing. I mean, no, they were... no we recorded them. We oh, you did. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And, but it was more like live television because it was a low budget. Nickelodeon didn't have the big budget, you know, like a lot of the shows do. So yeah, yeah. at the time it was like the director and producer said, don't stop, just, just figure keep, it out on the going. spot. Yeah. Keep going. Just yeah. keep going. If we need, if it's a complete <laughs> disaster or one of the games, because what would happen is we'd, I'd come in in the morning and they would have, they would set the stage. We would have uh, four games. And then what they would do is they would teach me the games yeah. and they would say, okay, <laughs> run them. And it was like 45 minutes of teaching me four games. And then I would do a show and we would do four shows with the same four games. Um, uh, and then they would spread them out during the run. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was, yeah. So it was uh, two in the morning and two in the afternoon and it was exhausting. It was two, yeah. two in the morning Two no, not 2 a.m. Two okay. shows in the morning. Got it. Oh, God. And then two in the afternoon. Like, how did you get, yeah. how'd you get little kids at two in the morning? <laughs> yeah. No, they would bring kids in. They, that would yeah. Go to Orlando. They bring kids in from schools. And no, just what, what, a, I, I mean, that stuff goes into the, I mean, those are stories you tell your kids. I mean, that, that's, that's just so fascinating. Have the kids, well, have the kids seen, obviously they've seen you on YouTube, right? A, a little bit. They, they're really, <laughs> to be honest with you, it's dad. They're not interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My kids don't watch the podcast either, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, I, but my oldest son, I have a, my oldest son champ will be uh, 30 his next birthday. Then I have a 16 year old and a 12 year old. And when Champ was little, I was uh, segueing into, I was a TV producer for this vision technology. We were working with all the networks and we got asked to go to um, the X Games. So my son was a big skateboarder. He loved skateboarding when he was like nine, eight. And so Tony Hawk and- Oh, and, wow. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, Bob Burnquist and Andy McDonald, all these guys were there. And I was, I had been working with them. Uh, pre prepping for the X Games. I was one of the uh, kind of specialty camera technology producers, the executive producer of this technology. And so they were there. So we were backstage and I had Champ and he was about eight or nine years old. And, and uh, Champ, Champ says to me, he goes, dad, dad, there's Tony Hawk. And I said, <laughs> what? I said, buddy, would you like to meet Tony? And he goes, what? And I said, hey, Tony, 
And he turned around and said, hey, Skip, hey, this must be your son, Champ, that you told oh, no me about. Way. No and, you way. Know, and oh. Champ's face. And he came over and talked to him for like five minutes. And he had been playing the Tony Hawk, uh, you know, uh, a sure. game. Yeah. So yeah. It, I was the best dad in the world during that. Oh, yeah. So, I was just going to say dad of the year, probably still running. Oh, I mean, that- <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so- that was that was that was when, you know, having having that connection actually made me feel good for my kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So so let's let's kind of segue to this idea that you're a you're a business leadership life and success coach, right? Right. Um, I, I, I really want to dig into this, but I have to say, uh, e- even in my role in education over the years, mm-hmm. um, I've, I've had incredible opportunities to speak to, let's say, you know, at graduation, hundreds of people, maybe, maybe thousands, right? It's mm-hmm. exhilarating. And, 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 and I love it, right? It's the, it's the proof of concept. It's the ROI. It's the talking to the parents. I, I absolutely sure adore it but i have not <laughs> spoken to millions of people whether recorded or live right so i i've just got to ask what that feels like whether you're filming a game show or you're traveling with the circus or you're producing the x games or you're delivering messages as a, as a coach as a as a leader right right what what do you do to prepare yourself for that kind of an audience? Well, you know it's interesting um, because, uh, as you said, I've done I've taught like a thousand workshops, done a thousand appearances, and have been on stage my entire life basically in front of people, and that's been my job is mm-hmm. to first to entertain, and then to uh, educate, right? educate yeah, yeah. while you're you're doing it with a bit of entertainment because it really goes in and um you know i i think that just with anything that any of us do that authentically being ourselves and not trying to put on any air not trying to pretend to be something that we're not and i'll tell you a quick story i i was on a soap opera for a little while and and as I was taking an acting class for soap operas, I was learning to, you know, every, every kind of medium has a different style. So I was, I was studying and I came in to do a scene and the guy who was the, the acting coach said, wait, Skip, time out. What are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm acting. And he said, you know what? That's bullshit. You are not being you. You're pretending to be somebody else. And I went, isn't that what acting is? And he said, it can be. But he said, let me just tell you this, and this will be a life lesson for you. Be the best you you can be all the time. Don't pretend to be something else. Don't pretend to have some skills that you don't have. If you don't have it, say it. Be you. Because if it's not this job, it'll be the next job. And if you're the right character, who you are, the essence of you, you'll get hired on the spot the next time. So don't try to be what you think the producer, the director wants you to be. That, that what brilliant advice that um, transcends careers, right? Industries. Totally. We could tell a young cook the exact same thing. Absolutely. You know, cook, it, cook from your it, heart, right? Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. It, what is important to you? What are you passionate about? What are you, what's important and, and gets you up in the morning? What is your mission, your vision for you as a person? And I, I years later, a few years later, that came back to me. I, here's a, a little story. I, when I was an actor, I, 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 went in for an audition for this movie. I didn't know what the movie was. I just said, somebody wanted to meet you. And I'm like, really? They saw you on TV in a commercial and they want to meet you. I walk into the room. It's Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis. And they were casting a Back to the Future. And they auditioned me and they spent an hour and a half with me, just me, talking to me, auditioning me. And they said, wow, the essence of you in that commercial 
was exactly what we're looking for in this uh, in this role of Marty McFly, the lead in the movie. Yeah. So yeah. I was the the New York choice and flew to L.A. And when I was auditioning and I was doing they screen tested me. And when I was doing it, Zemeckis, who was the director, I would say, Bob, would do you want some, me to do something else? And he would shake his head and he would go, Skip, you are uniquely you and I love it. And I don't want to tell you to do something different because it'll change this really unique delivery that you do. And I don't want to mess with it. And I didn't, at the time, I, I, I didn't know if that was a compliment or not, because mm-hmm. he was a not afraid to direct me, but he didn't want to tamper with something that he thought was unique mm-hmm. and special. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it you know, it, it came back, it's come back to me again and again and again and again in all aspects of my life. But yes, you're right. A line cook, or if you're starting a restaurant, if you're a waiter, you know, I waited tables for a little while in New York and I was getting like a hundred percent tips. And the manager was like, what are you telling these people? So just being me and yeah. they, they are rewarding me for giving them a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so it was, it, it, it's, it's, it's whatever you do, be you, it, you know, and don't apologize for it. No, great, great. Unapologetic. Yeah. I love, I, I, I love that. We're, we're, I, I, I want to, I want to mention skip lackey.com praxis leader Academy, uh, dot com. We'll put those into the to the show notes, um, okay. but I want to make these connections, right? So, you, a lot of the work you do today, Skip, is to help organizations find the best solutions for making their their businesses healthy and successful, right? Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, can you take me back again? All of this work, right? Yeah. The circus, Broadway, television, game show, being in front of Spielberg. The highs, the lows, the the great advice. How how did that all combine into your style of leadership development and, and the advice that you give big organizations around the country? Sure. So I was um, I went from being an actor, went to you know went to clown college, acting school, went to film school, started directing, and I got basically into a leadership position, and I owned a restaurant. That, that had 70 employees when I was 30. And uh, so I was realizing that leadership was something that was important to me. So I started a seminar business here in the United States uh, to help people. Basically, it was um, a personal growth seminar that I was sharing. And as I started doing it, I became more and more uniquely myself and realized that humor, uh, authenticity, and, um, you know, being uniquely me was, was ultimately important because when people believe you and you're speaking from your heart, you can draw those people in and the right people are drawn to you from a leadership perspective. So as we were doing this personal growth work, it morphed into somebody came to us and said, hey, can you take the work that you're doing and, and do this in, in corporate? But or in and actually the one the this this gal was creating a leadership program for the Justice Department of Canada, and they wanted to try to you know unite all of the key leaders in the Justice Department of Canada. So they gave us this contract, and we developed this very specific work, which I now call the Praxis Leadership Academy, which teaches people at their core how to be authentic leaders and do it consciously. And so that's where it kind of morphed into and people would then like it. So, you know, I I go into businesses and uh, can help with leadership because how you do one thing is how you do everything. So how you are in life is how you show up at work, you know? So people want to separate those two things, but it's really difficult, especially in the restaurant industry. You know, there's so many things that show up in life and can cause upheaval. So if you're a manager, if you're a leader, if you're an owner, you have to learn how to kind of roll with the punches. You have to learn how to be resilient. You have to learn how to have more emotional and social intelligence. Um, You've got to learn and what I call a a, a win-learn attitude. You know, for years it was win-lose and I think it's win-learn. There is no lose. 
It's just, yeah, what yeah. am I learning? You know? I, I, I love the how you do one thing is how you do everything. That that consistency right. piece. How, how how do you create or how do you help create conscious engagement in in leaders? Let's say when you, when when you're up there and that's the goal. You've got seventy five leaders in an organization in front of you. How do you how do you create that that conscious engagement? Sure. Or, or so- try to to help them. Create. Well, yeah, yeah, they've got to create it. In they've themselves. got to do it. Yeah. And yeah. they have to want to, you know, so many times good technicians or people who are skilled at their job, either become an owner and or become a manager mm-hmm. uh, or a leader of some kind. And just because somebody is good at their job doesn't mean they're going to be a good leader. That, that, that does not necessarily equate because we have our own baggage that we carry into. Oh, hey, I'm a leader. What does that mean? For somebody, it might mean uh, uh, inspiring people to be their best. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope. But for some others, it's control. I mean, the concept of leadership and towing the line, right? That was what managerial skills came from is during the Industrial Revolution, there were, you know, all of the uh, manufacturing uh, assembly lines, you had to tow the line, put your toe up there and make sure there was a body there. And so at all costs, they were the cracking the whip, you got to show up, you're fired. Um, that, that type of leadership does not work any longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ask, I ask uh, owners and CEOs and, you know, vice presidents all the time, with your employees, if you weren't paying them, would they still show up? What would your business look like if you treated your employees like volunteers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would your business look like if you treated your employees like volunteers and and it wasn't just about the money because it's not. If you're not inspiring people and giving them a mission and a vision of what's important to them, especially now, there's so many opportunities elsewhere people will leave. And I'm not saying that there are times when you go, hey, you got to, you got to toe the line. There are times when you got to let, there are rules, there are systems, there are things that we need to do. But if you can be a leader that focuses on not motivating, but inspiring, and there's a difference between motivation. I love that you say that, that the push pull, right? I, I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah, because yeah, motivation is come on, guys, let's go. It, and, yeah. And that just that goes away. But if you have yeah. a vision and you can inspire people and you show them what the vision is of, you know, of your restaurant, of your of your job, of your organization, of your sales group, and they can see the vision and they can jump on board, then they'll motivate themselves. Yeah, hundred percent. When when right. you're when you're skip when you're working with let's say small to medium sized companies, right. wh- what are some of those common challenges that you find that you're asked to to help remedy? Well, these days every everybody is is it's it's a problem with um, employees, mm-hmm. right? Finding mm-hmm. employees, hiring them, keeping them engaged. What does that look like? And what I tell small, even small businesses, small that have, you know, 10, six, five employees still do a mission, vision, and set of values, because that's the glue that holds everything together. That when you're meeting with them, when you're talking with them, that you can, um, you can refer back to. I mean, I, I went through today before the podcast, there's a, there's a group, a restaurant group out of uh, Napa called Southside. Southside Grill, and they've hired me to come in and work with their team. So they had three restaurants and then they had a catering business. And so they were going a million miles an hour. And I met them through a business coaching program that I was, I was working with. And, you know, I was telling them the importance of that when they were telling me they were having, uh, you know, not issues, but they were trying to find a way to encompass everything that they did and get people to to work in the same direction, even if they're at one unit, to be able to plug them in over here if they had a problem. So we I got together, spent time with the senior uh, management team. There were about five people. And I said, you know, we just sit down and say, what's really important? What is it you do? Why do you do it? 
And what is it, what's your vision of what you want to see? So for them, their mission became, uh, well, whatever we do, we want to do it and be great at it. We want people to walk away and say, oh my God, I love being here. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. their mission statement turned into, no matter what, we deliver excellence. So what does that mean? So they're the somebody in the, the kitchen, they're out of lettuce and they send somebody to the store to buy lettuce. Do you buy crappy lettuce or do you mm-hmm. buy the really, do you spend the extra 20 seconds to look at a really good head of romaine? You know, sure. Yeah. Might not think about saying, hey, make sure you buy the good lettuce. But if your mission that you're delivering, we deliver excellence, then you go a little above and beyond. It's got to be for everything, everything, including the lettuce. Everything. How how should along those lines, you're you're around the table with with groups like Southside. How how should in your mind, Skip, leaders think about the health, the overall health of their organization? How should they think about it? Well, it it goes back to how would you take care of yourself, right? It's like it's like that metaphoric concept of if you're on an airplane and the, the oxygen masks drop out and you've got a kid, do you put it on the kid first or you put it on you first? You have to put it on you so that you can be there to help them. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes owners of small businesses are so taxed and they're so worn out and they don't take care of themselves and they, they just don't believe that. You know, mm-hmm. they, have to, they have to focus it and build the right um, systems yeah. So that they have something to work with and build on. To me, a small business, you know, you go, well, this is just the way we do it. Well, is the system written down? Is it formalized? Because if it's not, it's not a system. It's just mm-hmm. a way of doing things you're trying to pass on to a few employees, but you can't scale. You know, it's kind of like the e-myth, Michael Gerber's the e-myth, which when I first read that, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Um, but it's that concept of system, systems, and more systems that you're flexible with and you change and you grow with, but you've got to be able to have something that you as the owner can step away. Mm-hmm. You can take the time that you need, sometimes giving the employees the reins to succeed and fail. They'll learn sure, and sure. you've got to let them do their thing and they'll take, take charge. But if you control, um, you're too controlling, you're micromanaging, you're disempowering your employees, they'll leave. And then you can't abdicate and just go, okay, you guys just do it, right? That's a, that's just as bad as being overly controlling. Yeah, yeah. Is abdicating and just not having some bumpers or some boundaries for people to work in. A lot of our, um, a lot of students and graduates listen to the podcast, and and they'll be curious if, um, and 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 many are at early stages in their careers, right? Maybe the beginning sure. of their careers. Right. Um, if you could give any advice at all to, let's say, Escoffier students um, and other listeners, maybe one or two tips on how to be or start to become good leaders or even good entrepreneurs, like, what would that be? What's the mindset to get to where it's optimum? Right. Oh, well, the first thing would be to do your own personal growth work. Mm -hmm. Right. We've all had our stuff that's happened to us in our life and to study emotional intelligence and also social intelligence, emotional, social intelligence is the key to anything and everything in life. And there's all kinds of stuff online. You can go learn about emotional intelligence, what it is, and then you can dig into the aspects and you're like, you know, I I could be a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. So often. You know, people have a vision, but they don't go out to and get a mentor. Get a find somebody that's doing what you're doing and approach them very respectfully. Send them a card. And it doesn't have to be somebody you know or even somebody that you 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 don't have to meet them through somebody that you do know. Mm -hmm. You could just reach out to people. And I've had people say this to me before. Would you be willing to mentor me? Well, it's kind of what I do as a living, but I have taken on some, stu- you know, some folks to be able to mentor them because of their persistence of wanting to fully understand. And they were willing to really jump in and dive in 
and learn from the ground up and listen. You know, that, that old metaphor of you've been given two ears and one mouth for a reason. You don't have to know everything. It's refreshing when you're with somebody and they, they're just really listening and ask questions, questions, and more questions. You can never ask enough questions. Again, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna tap. Go I'm, I'm gonna tap into your expertise now. <laughs> I'll get into the business side of it. So, I'd, I'd love for you to talk about, um, kind of go back to your journey, right? So, lots of opportunities have presented themselves to you, with all all all, all that we've chatted about already. What typically, Skip, is your strategy to evaluate those opportunities and then to move on and to embrace them? And how has that served you well? I'm, you can tell I'm trying to find the lessons here that people take away. It's right. right. The stuff is it's it's the age of relationships, right? Um, the, yeah. the age of information. It's coming at us a million miles an hour. Um how, how do you just step back and, and understand, okay, this is good for me. This is good for me. It's, it's, it's consistent with what I've been doing, or do I step out of my comfort zone and try something crazy? But again, well, tough question. <laughs> no, no, not really. Because trying something crazy when you're young is when you want to do it, right? Yeah, when you get yeah. a little bit older and you've established, you have a family, <laughs> maybe you have some children or you, other you responsibilities. Know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then it becomes really difficult to take that risk. Um, I think it's what gets you to jump out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. What, what really excites you? And there'll come a time maybe, I mean, like you said, you, you said at the beginning of your show, a serial entrepreneur, I've had <laughs> lots of businesses and I've helped lots of businesses, you know, uh, define what it is that they want out of their business. Um, but I've had to pivot. I've had to pivot a number of times. And it gets to the point where I'm hard-headed and I've had to learn to not be so <laughs> hard-headed. Uh, but there reaches a point when you go, you know what, I need to pivot. This is not happening. I've done everything I can do uh, to make this work and it's not working. Mm -hmm. So let's pivot. There's nothing wrong with taking a few steps back to move forward. Think of a chess chessboard. Never is there a grandmaster who doesn't make moves backwards to then go forward and win. Sure, the game. sure. Yeah, good sometimes analogy. you have to yeah. pivot, take a couple steps back to be able to move forward um, and, and really look at the big picture. But I, I just think that following your heart and following your passion is, is you know, it's, I mean, it's overused. People say it all the time, but it's true. How does that what tie in to, you, you, you just brought serial entrepreneur up again. So, so help define that for us. What, what is it for you, for Skip, what does it mean to be a serial entrepreneur? Does it mean that you're constantly looking, you're evaluating opportunities all the time? Well, it's funny. I had uh, just a couple of days ago, I had somebody that I was helping that said, hey, do you want to get involved with what we're doing? They were building a, you know, I was coaching her and she was building an animal sanctuary to help vets, um, you know, uh, work out of their PTSD and work with animals that are traumatized. And, you know, it's like I, I, I volunteered to be on her board, uh, be a part of her board, but, it, you know, it was, it's a beautiful opportunity and my heart goes, oh, wow, that would be great to be able to do that kind of work. But where am I at right now in my life? So you've got to look at the big, the macro and the micro. Mm -hmm. I mean, where mm -hmm. I'm at right now, you know, I'm here. I still have kid, young kids and you have to look at the big picture and the small picture. So personally, I was raised, my father was a serial entrepreneur um, where he had 10 businesses going on at any given time, some mm -hmm. small, some large. And he, you know, uh, so I was raising that. So it was kind of normal to get something together, get it to see if it's going to work. And if it works great, you flourish it and then you sell it or you keep it or you get the right managing management team involved or you move on and you let go of it and you let go of that business. Personally, for me, I mean, I've gone through multiple changes, right? From the entertainment industry, I've gone from being on stage, being in front of camera to then, you know, and then really studying intensely with one of the most famous acting teachers in the world, 
I really understood my craft. And then I, I got behind the camera and started producing and directing when I went to film school. So for me, it's growth. It's growth and learning. That's what excites me. I create material. Um, and, and then it's a matter of stopping and saying, hey, how do we make a, a business model out of this? Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know. I was going to ask what invigorates you and you, you, you moved right into that. Um, I'm going to, I, I, I've taken tons of notes here, right? So um, I'm getting this at no cost, by the way, you can invoice me, <laughs> but I, I just want to go back for a minute. Um, you, you talked a lot about mission, vision, set of values that can you, can you speak just very, very high level to that? Maybe, maybe for the audience sort of differentiate mission vision where's the north star fall in right is it is it the vision first then the mission statement and then the set of values i would i'm, I'm trying to create the analogy of a house is that our foundation that that we live every single day well you know they i think they go hand in hand right for me okay. it's mission vision and then the values are the core and i also have this other um uh, it's it's a process that I call above the line, below the line, which once you create a handful of values that are important to the company, then you create a way of being able to say, well, what is important to us and where do we take responsibility? And then the fact that, you know, underneath that, the below the line, we don't go there. We don't do these things. So you're creating bumpers for employees and for management teams. So like a, a vision, a, a vision would say, you know, what do you want to create? And you don't, you think big, mm -hmm. you know, you think big. Um, even if it's a small little organization, you still think big. My personal vision statement is to see 5 million people wake up to the truth of who they are by whatever means necessary. That's my personal vision statement. Mm -hmm. So being an, and I've been in front of a million people so far and countless people have heard, you know, a different podcast or radio program or whatever. And I've affected a lot of people that have then gone out and affected other people. So am I at 5 million? I don't know. When I first came up with it, I'm like, oh my God, 5 million. That's a lot. And then my, you know, my thinking break tried to shut it down and I went, no, stop. How that happens is not my, it's, it, that's not my job. Yeah, yeah. My job yeah. is to stay true to what my vision is. And then, you know, you read my mission statement and then my own, my own personal values, but everybody's a little different, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I was, I was in a multi-billion dollar uh, boardroom of a company out in San Francisco with, with a, with a business partner. And we were pitching to do a, a big coaching program, leadership coaching program inside. And they were like, well, we've got 70,000 employees and, you know, they're, no one's really working together and they're kind of doing their own thing and that. And I said to him, well, what, what's your mission statement? And the CEO, and, and I'm sitting with all of the C-level and they were mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, you know, uh, what? And, and they started looking around the room at each other. Do you have, do you have a vision statement? Yeah, it's, um, you know, and they, they didn't know what it was off the top of their head. How about values? Uh, uh, honesty, uh, integrity. What else? What else was it? And I looked at them and, I, and, and my partner and I said, look, if, if you don't know what they are, how do you expect anybody else in the company to know what they are? 100%. You, yeah. 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 So yeah. It, it is so important that you as the entrepreneur, or the business owner know what your vision is so that every time if you have anybody and that goes with an employee that goes with a customer that goes with a, a vendor anybody that you're coming into contact with that is your guiding star yeah your yeah. mission your vision and your values no um, and it's a system for inspiration so it, it all comes together. You, I, I love because we've talked about this on the sidelines. I love that you went and took me, took us to above the line, below the line. You explained that to me once weeks ago, right? Um, right. 
So we're getting to know each other too well. So you took that bait really, really, really well. Um, <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. Um, one last comment, and this is the fastest forty-five minutes that I can recall. We, we, we got to, we got to wrap it up in a minute. But coming back to mission, vision, core values, um, working up the other way, big, big vision. I like that. But what was really interesting is your personal mission and the mission that you mentioned. Um, for the for the group that you're working with, Southside Grill, was very brief. I, I I think in education specifically, I've seen missions that include the entire curriculum and everything we teach, but it doesn't need to be lengthy. It just needs to be powerful, right? Part of my time with Southside or any of the restaurants or businesses that I work with, by the end of the day, they can. They have it memorized. Yeah, They know yeah. what it is because it comes yeah. from their heart. It's yeah. their vision. It's their mission. And it's their values. And it's not just integrity, honesty, you know, excellent. It, it is a, a living, breathing value. You know, like, um, like for Southside, one of their, one of their um, actions and values was engage with our community. So they want to be a part of the community. They want to really engage on all levels. They have a sense, have a sense of anticipation and urgency. Mm, so is mm. that is like, hey, we're going to do everything fast, but they did it to the point where it means something. Yeah, yeah. Anticipate, yeah. anticipate what somebody's needs are and do it quickly with urgency, right? Yeah, yeah. We all rode together and have each other's backs. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the team works together. It's a way of, of creating something that actually is a living, breathing value as opposed to just a word that means yeah. nothing. Yeah. You know? Brilliant, brilliant advice. We've done a lot of work at Escoffier as well. I'll read to you. Our vision is simply to improve the world of food one learner at a time, which I absolutely love. Says it all, right? Yeah. And it it rolls into our mission, which is simply to cultivate lifetime careers in food and wellness industries by offering affordable, accessible, and socially minded education and training. So simple. But yep. years ago, Skip, I, I would have had to use a cheat sheet. It was a paragraph. It was, <laughs> it was a paragraph. Oh, yeah. It, it was, was a little, paragraph little that, that so, you know, that you read that doesn't mean anything. But now, yeah, it's like yeah, it, it's, it's it, you've got some passion in, in, in your mission statement. It's super powerful. Okay. Speaking of passion, the name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. So I got to ask you, putting you on the spot, what is the ultimate dish in your world? Gosh, um, the ulti ultimate dish. You know, <laughs> it goes back to um, my grandmother was an amazing country cook. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to her house. And the ultimate dish for me is this memory of being at her house, uh, my dad's mom in West Virginia, and the coal mines of West Virginia, and she would make these biscuits from scratch. And we used to ask her when we were teenagers, hey, can you give us the, the, uh, uh, the recipe? And she just <laughs> would move stuff over. And so we got her to do that one time. And one of my cousins <laughs> measured it. And, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so we have our, my grandmother Lackey's uh, recipe for biscuits. And whenever the family gets together, that's what everybody mem remembers. So I love it. What do you put on the biscuits? Is it like honey, jam? No, just butter. They're so oh, good. Oh, just butter. Oh. Biscuits. Yeah, oh, with, I, with butter. Oh, I my God. They, they're flaky and beautiful. And, you know. We've never had food. anybody just get right into. I, I love that. That's that's a food memory that brings back, oh. um, um, you know, grandma. I love that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So was she in West Virginia or Arkansas? She was in West Virginia. She Virginia. was in, okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Business pulled us out to Arkansas. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. That's great. Hey, yeah. buddy, thank you so much for spending some time and 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 oh, yeah. providing such great feedback. This was a lot of fun. I really, really appreciate it. And hey, baseball starts this week. Oh, yeah. We're <laughs> already in practice. Summer yeah. session. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And thanks for having me on the show, Kirk. I like, you know, I've said my mission is to help people wake up. So if somebody is 
taking something, a little pearl from what I've said, or maybe it stimulates somebody in some way. Uh, that's what makes me happy. So, you know, I, I'm just, I, I'm, a, I'm an open book. I'm like, you know, somebody asked me a question. It's like, blah, 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 blah. I'll talk and share and <laughs> give it away. Because, it, it, you know, the universe provides, it all comes back. So thank you for letting me, giving me a platform to be able to share my passion. I love it, buddy. Win and learn. Yeah. Win and yeah. learn. Skip Lackey. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.